I'm Mo Rocca, and I'm excited to announce season four of my podcast, Mobituaries. I've got a whole new bunch of stories to share with you about the most fascinating people and things who are no longer with us. From famous figures who died on the very same day to the things I wish would die, like buffets, all that and much more. Listen to Mobituaries with Mo Rocca wherever you get your podcasts. I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support, too. That's where Ollie comes in, with their delightful, hard-working gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Welcome back, everyone, to another China History Podcast episode. Laszlo Montgomery here with you once again. And today, I have the pleasure to welcome Beijing long-timer James Zimmerman onto the CHP. James is a partner in the Beijing office of the prestigious law firm Perkins Coie, and he's been in China since 1998, the Jiang Zemin days. James was also the four-time chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce in China, and you'll see him in your news feeds as a political commentator on U.S.-China relations. And fresh out of the oven from Hachat Press is his new book, The Peking Express, The Bandits Who Stole a Train, Stunned the West, and Broke the Republic of China. Welcome to the CHP, James Zimmerman. Thank you. It's a great opportunity to be here. So let's just dive right in. The story you've written about in your new book, The Peking Express, it happened over a period of more than five weeks in May and June 1923. What was some of the historical background relevant to these events? This happened seven years into the warlord era. I mean, this was this was not a great time for China. The um, You know, there was a revolving door of warlords since the fall of the Qing. Um, and it was unfortunately a time where, um, you know, the country was in a state of chaos, um, a lot of violence between the different warlord groups, you know, province to province, city to city. You know, there was warlords everywhere and um, each had their own army. Uh, and unfortunately, um, because of the ongoing violence that was taking place between the different factions, you had the peasantry, the, the villages were, you know, caught up in the crossfire. And what was happening was, you know, when one army prevailed over another army, you ended up having a situation where troops were disbanded or were basically they scattered. And so there was a, a large population of floating armed men that in some respects were starving, had no jobs, and they had no choice in some respects but to become you know, become bandits, become outlaws. So unfortunately that you had these banded armies forming, but and it was not just a disbanded soldiers, but you had a lot of people that were either caught up in the crossfire that had issues against the, the ruling warlords and they would join the brigands. And so that was a very, it was that revolving door of disbanded soldiers and actually army troops was something that created a lot of tension. Now, the response of the warlords themselves was to engage in suppression campaigns. And so rather than trying to correct the problem, such as to disarm the soldiers or to find them jobs, basically they were just suppressing them. And uh, on top of that is anybody, anybody that had a grudge against the government, anyone that was uh, political opposition was labeled as a bandit. And once they're labeled as a bandit, you know, it was heads off, you know, it was an immediate summary execution. And so you had uh, situations where through the bandit suppression campaigns, there was a growing amount of repression and people were getting really upset. And in the situation involving the Peking Express, we had a gentleman by the name of Sun Meiao, who is the, the bandit chief. He was uh, not happy with the, the provincial warlord who actually executed Sun Miao's brother and then basically soon took up arms against the warlord to basically get them out of, you know, southern Shandong. But that's the political situation that we were dealing with at the time. And it wasn't very good. It was, a, I mean, a reflection of chaos 
and excesses of the warlord period. So let's talk about the train. When did the Peking Express come into operation, and who were the typical passengers of this train back then? And China was very late to railroad building. There wasn't much back then, was there? There was some, you know, keep in mind, China was very, very slow to warm up to the idea of trains. The first train in China in 1876 was, uh, you know, a nine-mile narrow-gauge train between Shanghai and the port of Busong. And it only lasted a year. Basically, the Qing government was not happy with it dug it up, you know, and tossed the rails and the cars in the ocean. China was not, did not really welcome trains like the rest of the West. Fast forward to the turn of the century, 1900, China had only about 10 miles of serviceable track in comparison with the United States. uh, The U.S. had 193,000 miles of track crisscrossing the country, servicing pretty much every frontier town in the nation. And it wasn't like China was so much behind the times as it was another planet altogether. So when the Qing government was overthrown by the Republican government, the Republican government made it a priority, a national priority to build the railroads. And there was a lot of different reasons for that, not just for commerce and trade, but also to unify the country, which was pretty much fractured, and they needed to weigh to bring the country together. And then slowly, starting in the 20s, they saw the value of tourism, you know, a value of transport between Shanghai, Peking, and other parts of the country. I mean, keep in mind, before the railroad, a trip between Shanghai and Peking was a five-day journey by ocean-going vessel for most of it, and that was weather permitting. Now, with the railroad, of course, it made it a lot faster. It went from a five-day journey to a 36-hour journey. You know, so the government saw the value of all this and started investing in new rail cars. You know, with the the express trains, Peking Express North and Shanghai Express going south. The government had invested in rail cars that were state-of-the-art, remarkable technology for the day. Before there was all steel construction cars, you know, most rail cars were made of wood. And wood was not fire safety. And in, in the event of a collision, a lot of times the cars would telescope one on top of another, you know, and the fatality rate for the wooden cars was pretty high. So the government invested in these steel cars and also because it was advertised that the steel, all steel passenger cars were bulletproof and they could endure traveling through bandit ridden territories such as in central China, southern Shandong and so forth. And so with the Peking Express that the service, the express train service started January 1, you know, of 1923. And um, at that point, this was a big deal, and tourism was booming, and a lot of people from around the world were traveling to China to see this mysterious and exotic country, historical sites, you know, that have been advertised as stepping in the shoes of Marco Polo, as he did centuries before. So it was a booming time for the railroad, but at the same time, there was trouble in the heartland with the growing issues of banditry and violence between the warlords and the peasants. And so, but that's, that's the situation we had when the train left the station May 5th, 1923. May 6th, 1923, 2.40 in the morning, the train derails and the bandits attack. Was this the first time this happened to the Peking Express? It had only been in operation a few months. Yeah, this is the first real train robbery that China experienced. There were smaller issues where there was theft on the train by people that were actually on the train, but a real true holdup and derailment in this situation was the first of a kind. And the bandits went through the the whole process of derailing this very large line of train cars that had 300 passengers on board. So yeah, this was the first time that this happened. And it was, you know, it was a big deal. It was, uh, it was something that really captured not just the local interest, but global interest as well. 
Yeah, I regret she was only part of the ordeal for a short time, but the famous Lucy Aldrich, sister-in-law to John D. Rockefeller Jr., was uh, among the captured hostages. What was she doing on that train ride to Beijing? You have to imagine in, in 1923, with the increasing interest of tourism, you have people from all over the world. Lucy Aldrich herself was a very sophisticated woman who, um, you know, this was actually her second circumnavigation of the globe, second time in China, you know, and she was someone that spent a lot of time collecting, you know, um, Asian artwork, um, Asian textiles. And so this trip was important for her as a buying trip, as a, a trip to increase and enhance her collection. And so she was on her way to Peking to meet with um, sellers and traders of textiles and antiques. So that's why she was on the train. Okay, so let's look at one of the main characters. You already mentioned Sun Mei Yao. How did he come up with this daring scheme? And besides avenging his brother's execution, what was he after? And, And also, if you can, can you talk a bit about what was the state of Shandong province during this particular time in the warlord era? I mean, it was a situation where the warlord, um, the warlord at the time in the province was Tian Chung Yu, who was, um, he was definitely a bad guy. He was a, he was very, very corrupt. And in southern Shandong, there was a lot of coal mining going on, a big investment in the coal mines. But General Tian, the, the warlord, was, you know, operating his own protection racket to protect the coal mines and protect the 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 trade but he was also he was very wary of uh, any competition he was very wary of the disbanded soldiers that were returning such as Sun Miao because he was with a local militia that was disbanded and he came home to his native Lincheng Zhaozhuang area and when he arrived I mean he, he was basically in competition in some respects with uh, General Tian. General Tian sent him um, sent Sun Miao a message by executing his brother, who was actually a well-known scholar in the region. And this basically triggered a personal vendetta, a personal civil war. And Sun Miao's agenda, he was not in this for for money. It was there was not a situation where it was a- economic issues and robbery to to gain ransom. Basically, what he wanted was to have General Tian and his soldiers and the Shandong Provincial Army removed from southern Shandong area so that Sun Miao can, could set up his own army and the, his own brigadier general in the region. And, and that was his primary goal. Under him, Sun Miao had 700 ex-soldiers in his bandit army, but he joined forces with a gentleman by the name of Popo Lu, who was representative more of the underbelly of the bandit trees. Popo Lu was, was addicted to alcohol and drugs and, and opium, and he was a very, very violent man. And the 300 men that were in Popo Lu's army were really hardened criminals, and they joined forces with Sun Miao and soon welcomed Popo Lu's men to basically build his ranks in order to hold up the train, which was the plan. Now, the time chosen was a weekend when the train guards were gone. Most of the train guard officials had gone up to Tianjin to attend a dinner, which was the birthday celebration for the train guard chief. And so the rail line was without the rail guards that were patrolling the line at this time. And so what um, Sumiao did, based on the spy, his network of spies, he knew that the trains would, and the train lines and the tracks would not be fully attended by the railway police because those that remained behind, the real junior guys just didn't go to work. So the railway tracks were exposed. And so what he did was he, he captured some of the railway workers and they removed what are called the fish plates that hold the rails together. And he removed 16 fish plates and the railroad ties for um, 16 of the tracks. Now, when the conductor's go, um, you know, moving forward, he looks ahead because there's a very large um, headlight in the front of the train, in, in front of the locomotive. 
and he can see up 300 yards up the track, and he saw that there was nothing wrong with the track, you know, but the site that was chosen was on a slight upgrade and on a curb. And so the, the train, the conductor actually had to slow the whole train down anyway. But when he came to the site, he was actually going relatively slow. And then when he hit the track, the track that had no fish plates, the locomotive basically sank into the embankment, you know, and went to a stop in a grinding halt. And then the conductor did not have enough time to engage the brakes. And so the cars behind the locomotive started going zigzag. Some went into the field, some tipped over, and some, some just stayed put. But, you know, this was how Su Miao had derailed the train. And once the train had stopped and was derailed, his 1,000-man bandit army attacked the train. We already mentioned Lucy Aldrich. Who were some of the more prominent passengers on this ill-fated ride? There was John Powell, publisher of Shanghai's Weekly Review, and the Chicago Tribune's correspondent there. He figured quite prominently. Yeah, I mean, I always tell people to imagine yourself at the Shanghai Nanking Railway Station in the waiting room, a large waiting room, and then you can scan, scan the room. And what you see is a group of people that represents the diverse social fabric of Shanghai in general and those visiting China at the time. And so you will see not just Powell, but there were a number of other correspondents in the room, some very well-known correspondents. And why, why you had so many reporters on the train is that they were all heading up to inspect an American Red Cross reclamation project up by the Yellow River. So you got all these correspondents on the train. But you also had, in addition to Lucy Aldrich, you had other tourists. There were two U.S. Army majors and their families who were both stationed in the Philippines, which at the time, that's where American bases were following the Spanish-American War. But these two U.S. Army majors with their families were in that crowd within the train station waiting room. You also would see... The, a group of young men that represented Shanghai's Jewish merchants community, which at that time was a very large community that was a driving force of commerce and construction and development within Shanghai. A very impressive group of men who, you know, either were stockbrokers or they worked in different businesses for their families, but, and they would be on the train as well. And they were collectively referred to as the Shanghai Cousins. You also had a variety of businessmen, such as Leon Friedman, who was one of the largest automotive dealers in China at the time, representing a number of cutting-edge automobile manufacturers like Dodge, Chandler, Hopmobile, and a number of other leading automobile brands of the day. Um, And Friedman was an interesting guy in his own because before he came to China uh, in 1918, him, he and his brother were the leading air show promoters in the United States. And back around World War I time, air shows and what they called barnstorming shows were a real big deal. People would go to the county fair and watch a lot of the air shows. But the Friedman brothers were very, very successful and made a lot of money in that way. But they had done shows in Japan, and they were on their way to to organize a show, an air show in China, when they decided Shanghai was where they wanted to be. So the Friedman brothers, as automobile dealers, were very, very active in China, very well known. So they were, you saw Friedman there. And then you also saw wealthy honeymooners from specifically from Mexico that were in that room. So the waiting room was full of a lot of unique people. And what I forgot was a gentleman by the name of G.D. Musso. G.D. Musso was a, as a lawyer in Shanghai, very well-known lawyer, but he represented the Shanghai Opium Combine, the opium monopoly that was driving the opium trade. 
And Musso's clientele was a lot of, it was a mix of a lot of different, what we would consider to be shady clients like gun runners, casino operators, warlords, and so forth. And so Musso was there, a very unique individual, very well known, very wealthy. And he actually owned an interest, not just in things like Shanghai's tram car service, but he also owned an issue, uh, an interest in the South China Morning Post. So, so Musso was there. And the interesting thing, too, in 1923, Musso, an Italian, was a big, big supporter of the up-and-coming Mussolini. So uh, very, very interesting guy. So in this waiting room, you had a mix of, you know, you had Americans, British, French, Italians, Mexicans. You had Chinese dialects of all dialects from all over the country in that waiting room. You had Asians from all over Asia in that waiting room. 300 people getting ready to board the train May 5th, 1923, getting ready to go uh, on that fateful journey. And quite frankly, they had no idea what they were about to get into. So this well-heeled crowd take this trip, and just before three in the morning, this so-called Ling Chung outrage was off and running. Given the limits in communication at that time, how did those first 24 hours go? That was an interesting question because this could have been just a local event, but almost auto, um, immediately, because you had correspondence on the train, you had correspondence that became hostages, and then you also had correspondence that escaped from the incident. You know, word got out globally very quickly. And before, actually, the governments were able to get the word out. In fact, it was John D. Rockefeller Jr. that happened to be working his garden in Seal Harbor, Maine, on a Sunday morning of May 6th, when an Associated Press correspondence reporter came up to him in his garden and said, what do you think of the fact that your sister-in-law, Lucy Aldrich, has just been held captive by bandits in China. And Rockefeller's like, that's nonsense. I lead Sakoni, the Standard Oil of New York, and I have offices in every city in China, and I would have heard about this before some reporter would. So um, Rockefeller was very dismissive, but he did call the Secretary of State and say, and say what's going on in China? And the Secretary of State said, I have no idea. I haven't heard anything. And so, and he had to find out. And then in short order, the U.S. government began to realize that there was a crisis, a hostage crisis going on. I mean, it's a testament to the speed of the media, even back in 1923, with cables and telegrams being sent around the world. So the fact that the reporters were able to get this out, and quite frankly, over the entire 37-day crisis period, there was story after story after story. It was a front news issue. That was something that was addressed in the media and got and the word was out. So the media was played a very, very strong role in spreading the word about this uh, about the incident. Yeah, the headlines in the May eighth, nineteen twenty three China press were pretty sensational. Bandits loot train, abduct 120 foreigners and Chinese, two dead, two wounded, two million dollars demanded. Threatened death to all. Women barefoot in nightgowns, driven miles at bayonet point. China press man is victim. Escapes, tells thrilling tale of holdup. And that was just above the fold. I bet that sold a lot of papers. How did everyone living in the Shanghai International Settlement react to such news with so many nationalities and Lucy Aldrich, of all people, involved? It must have been quite a complicated ordeal sorting everything out. Yeah, I mean, the reaction was really quite, I mean, it was shocking, quite negative. You know, I mean, the people in Shanghai were very concerned about what's the impact on our assets, on our people, our safety. Why is the Chinese government not protecting the railroad? So, I mean, it was not just the Shanghai community, but the, the foreign communities in Tianjin and Peking and in other cities around China were very, very shocked by this. And globally, you know, the fact that uh, Rockefeller's sister-in-law was caught up in this created a lot of political issues back in Washington for the U.S. government. You know, Lucy Aldrich's father was the former senator of Rhode Island. 
and her brother was currently a member of Congress. And so the halls of Congress, as well as the administration, were very, very concerned about this. But so the reaction was really shocking. And the interesting thing is a lot of the headlines, yeah, they were a bit sensational. In fact, the headline that you quoted, I would say about 75% of it's right, but it's also was kind of exaggerated. The $2 million that were demanded, there was no real ransom demand initially. Some of the disbanded soldiers were demanding back pay, but it was not about ransom. It was really a, a more of a political agenda than anything. But the overall, you know, to answer your question, the reaction was, it was shock. And part of that was because in people like Carl Crow who released a, who had this, what's called the Handbook for China, which was the leading tour guide at the time. And Crow himself and other publishers promoted China as a very safe location for travel. Nothing to be worried about. In fact, in his Handbook for China, he has a whole section on bandits and pirates and rebellions. And he says, quote unquote, all in all, travel is as safe in China as in any other part of the world. Robbers and pirates exist, of course, and there is usually a revolution or rebellion going on in some part of the country. But these things add zest rather than danger to the journey. You know, Carl Crow needed to explain to the passengers of the Peking Express how this was really zest, and and he was very dismissive of the dangers. And so the people of Shanghai, tourists, and people of the world viewed it as a as a safe journey, but unfortunately, it wasn't. And so the, the reaction was, you know, quite shocking when this happened. Yeah, good old Carl Crow. Paul French wrote a book about Carl that I used in my Carl Crow episode from years ago. We'll get to him in a minute. Carl Crow, that is, not uh, Paul French. So some like Lucy Aldrich were set free, but everyone else ended up on a forced march to Baudugu Mountain. Why that place? Yeah, um, Patuku Mountain was considered to be the bandit stronghold. It was today, it's a beautiful area, beautiful mountain, a very imposing, impressive mountain that rises above the ground, I mean, by thousands of feet. Um, it was a, a location that the bandits, and this goes back centuries, it was basically a stronghold, a Shanzai a location where they kept their base of operation. And so, I mean, it was their home. And it was ultimately the location that they went to keep the hostages while the negotiations took place. It's a very, very interesting area because you had both Buddhist temples, you had uh, Taoist temples, and they were very active temples, despite the fact that the bandits were there. And, and even it was part of the Neon Rebellion of mid-1800s. So this area was an area that the band had used quite frequently and that because of its isolation and because of the geographical protection of the mountain itself, this was a perfect location for them to run to, to march to, to take these hostages and then base their operation out of there. How did the hostages survive the first week? All those irritable and demanding foreigners? How did Sun Mei Yao control them? Well, the first week was difficult because um, when people were dragged off the train, over half of those were not dressed properly. They were in pajamas or they did not have shoes. And that was a big issue actually for the first two, three days of running and marching so that when they went to their first location, they had to sort through the loot of the train to find shoes for people, to find clothing for them. People were wearing shoes that didn't fit or clothes that didn't fit or wasn't theirs. And so there was a ragtag group of hostages that with a thousand bandits going across the countryside while the army's chasing them. You know, when they finally got to their first destination, which was after two and a half days of trekking, it was a place called the Dragon Door Temple, which was actually today is called the Ganchuan Sweet Springs Temple. And they stayed there for a week. And after about three and a half, four days, they realized they didn't have food. They didn't have the provision of water and you know medicine and so forth they needed. And that's where Carl Crow stepped in, along with the American Red Cross, and they created what is was known as the American Rescue Mission. 
which was sort of supported by the American Chamber of Commerce as well as the Red Cross. And they provided food and then provisions to and created what they called was the Cooley Express, where they were having a little small group of local workers who were carrying the food from the rescue operation at the mining compound of South Wong to up to the bandit camps. And so during the first week, they went up to the, the Dragon Door Temple. And then after they moved to Pazuku Mountain, the American Rescue Mission was sending things up there for the duration of the 37 days. But, but it was, you know, as provisions were provided it made it you know much easier but before they got food from the rescue mission they were pretty much the hostages as well as the bandits were eating anything that they could get their hands on and that was the local you know fare that was provided by the villagers and it wasn't much and there were situations where they were eating local ravens and birds and shandong dog and things like that until they received provisions from the rescue mission. How many days was it where they had to hold out like that before food supplies started arriving? And it was about five full days. Oh, I bet know. that probably felt like five months. Yes. <laughs> so prior to the arrival of Roy Anderson onto the scene, how did the negotiations go? What were the first attempts at trying to reach Sun Mei Yao to get the ball rolling? I mean, the, the, first, um, the first person that went up to try to, to negotiate with the bandit camp was a German Catholic priest by the name of Father, Father Lenfers. Uh, Lenfers took it on his own to go up because he knew, he knew the bandits. He knew all of them. Father Lenfers was a priest that had been in, in Shandong area for 25 years. And so he knew these young men that were made up the bandit army, and they knew him very well. So Father Lenfers made the trip, the initial trip up, and, and started the discussions, opened the discussions with the bandit chiefs to find out what exactly that they wanted. And it was Father Lenfers that came back down to the mining compound with the message as to what the bandits actually wanted. And the key thing is they wanted the armies to back off. They wanted the Shandong army to back off. And in them, they started to realize, based on Father Lenfers' discussions with them, that the agenda was more of a political agenda, and it was not about ransom. And Lenfers also brought the message back that they needed food, they needed provisions, and that started the process of having the American Rescue Mission. So the first person that went up to begin negotiations, so to speak, was this German Catholic priest, Father Lenfers, who um, was part of the, the local Catholic community for years. But that, that began, and then in the meantime, the Peking government enlisted the support of Roy Anderson to step in and act as a neutral mediator, uh, facilitator of the discussions. Yeah, he was my favorite character, hands down. Can you explain who was Roy Anderson in 1923 and what was his involvement in the incident? Yeah, Anderson was a fixer. I mean, a pretty Im impressive guy. His parents were missionaries that helped start Suzhou University. His family had very strong roots in China, you know, from the missionary side. And actually some of the, the diplomats themselves were the children of missionaries. And, and part of that was, you know, they had very, very strong language skills. And Roy Anderson was someone, you know, that not only spoke, you know, multiple dialect comfortably as a native speaker, you know, but he was very close with a lot of the power brokers, you know, from the different factions. Um, and the, the warlords themselves had a lot of respect for him because of his language skills, because of his negotiating skills. And he actually participated, you know, in, in 1911 rebellion, uh, taking the side of uh, various warlords and that um, were fighting against the Qing government. So um, he was very well respected, you know, by the Republican government. And so from time to time, they would enlist him to support, like, negotiations. He also worked with, you know, different foreign companies, and um, specifically he worked for Sakoni, you know, the Rockefeller's company at the time doing um, negotiations, commercial negotiations. He was an American fixer, well-known in the foreign community as well as the Chinese community, 
I mean, he lived in Peking, you know, very close to where the foreign affairs offices were. And so and they called upon him to support the negotiations. Part of that was because um, Sao Kun, the real you know, warlord in power at the time, he could see that the bandits were just antagonized by the local you know, provincial warlord, General Tian, and that the bandits were just not going to negotiate. They were just not going to trust anything that Tian was saying or doing. And so Roy Anderson was brought in to do the negotiations. Initially, you know, and then over a couple of weeks period, Roy um, was sidelined by Tian, who tried and tried and tried to intervene and negotiate. And part of the reason why the thing lasted for 37 days was because, you know, the Tian did not want, you know, or was trying to push Roy Anderson aside, you know. And then ultimately it was uh, Roy stepped in and took charge of the negotiations. And that's something that is for readers to find out and read it. The overall story, but Roy Anderson was clearly, you know, a hero in this. You know, his creativity and his way of um, working with both the bandit side as well as the government side. Yeah, I was going to ask you to discuss the deal Roy Anderson made with Sun Mei Yao and Paul Paul Liu that ultimately got the hostages freed. But we'll make everyone buy the book to find <laughs> out that exciting part. Yeah. So let's get back to Carl Crow. How did he come to the aid of the hostages? And was he there on site throughout the ordeal? I mean, he was very close with Powell. I mean, Powell and Carl Crow, pretty much best friends. You know, and then when he heard about the situation, you know, he, uh, in effect, volunteered for the role of setting up the rescue mission. But at the same time, two things. One, he, you know, was also the, the, the Shanghai head of the American Red Cross um, Commission. And so it was part of his duty to working for the Red Cross. But then he also, as the author, you know, leading travel guide, I mean, he had to basically kind of protect his name here and again, step in and support um, and support the rescue mission. So he ended up arriving about five days, four days into the whole situation. Um, and um, when he first got up to Zhao Duong, he had come in, and it was only going to be temporary. He brought in basically about six or seven suitcases of food, clothing, and things like that. Um, but when he re- when he got to Zhao Duong, he realized this is going to be a big deal. This is going to be more than seven suitcases of food, and and he really started to to set up the infrastructure um, for his rescue operation. And he ended up staying the entire length of the negotiations to support the the rescue mission op, ha, um, situation. But, but yeah, he initially went up there thinking it wasn't going to last long. And then, um, you know, at the same time, too, the foreign governments, and specifically the U.S. government, um, they did not want to be involved and they did not want to be the ones leading the rescue mission. And so having a a, a basically a third party like the American Red Cross take the lead, you know, benefited everyone. And including the, I mean, even the Chinese side, the Chinese Red Cross didn't show up until close to, you know, halfway through the, you know, and so the Chinese Red Cross was not really incredibly helpful in taking the lead. And it was actually the American Rescue Mission that supported, provided food, you know, not just for the foreign hostages, you know, but also for some of the bandits, as well as providing, you know, for the Chinese hostages as well. So Carl Crow's thinking was if he provided food to also the bandits, some provisions such as rice and cigarettes, he could keep the bandits away from stealing the food that was being sent up for the hostages. Carl Crow, always thinking. Yes. <laughs> so almost five weeks. Why did it take so long? And such high profile people, so much at stake for the China government. Part of it was because there was an endless stream of government, Peking government or Shandong government authorities, including General Tian, that tried to negotiate the deal. But the bandits themselves did not trust anyone from the Chinese side at all. And so they, you know, there was a number of uh, negotiation delegations that tried to go up to the bandit camps to negotiate. But the bandits were not going to work out a deal with the, the Chinese side just because they didn't trust them. And their personal safety and security was critically important. They specifically got these foreign hostages 
which dragged in the involvement of the foreign governments indirectly so that they had some leverage. And without um, any kind of a guarantee, they, the bandits were just were not going to release any of these, you know, any of the hostages. And so things dragged on. Part of it because they were not, I mean, the Chinese side was not listening to the bandit side, but also to the army, you know, that had surrounded the bandit camps and the hostages would not back off. And they were constantly picking off and fighting and engaging in skirmishes and battles with different bandit groups. So it ended up taking a long time, you know, only because of these strategies were not, you know, working. And then eventually Roy Anderson took charge, as well as the, the hostages themselves took charge of the, the negotiations to move things forward. And that's where Powell comes in. And that's where they got to read the book because to see, you know, I mean, on that point, too, is I don't want to give away what happened. Things ended badly for some. And that's something that they have to read the book to see what happened overall for all the negotiation, because there's a lot of surprises. And, you know, the ending is climatic in a lot of different ways. Yeah, it's riveting. Get out of the trenches of tedious tasks like managing order fulfillment and start growing your business with ShipStation. They'll help increase profitability by automating your workflow with their simple, easy-to-use dashboard. With it, you can pretty much do everything you need to quickly and easily. Update order information, print labels, compare rates, optimize shipments, and even set up automatic delivery notifications. And it doesn't matter where you sell. Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify. ShipStation can integrate pretty much anywhere online. Another great thing about ShipStation? They can help reduce costs with industry-leading discounted rates from some of the biggest mail carriers. You might even be able to get up to 89% off USPS and UPS rates. So, make this year your most profitable one yet. Sign up for your free 30-day trial at ShipStation.com and use the code SPOTIFY. That's ShipStation.com with the code SPOTIFY. So as far as the title of your new book goes, we've seen how the bandits stole the train and stunned the West. But how did they break the Republic of China? I mean, on the day, you know, without getting into too much detail about, um, you know, how the process ended. But when the hostages were released, the Peking government collapsed. And it was the the President Lee's government was effectively taken over with by the warlord that sponsored him, Cao Kun, who basically came in and made himself president. Yeah, and Cao Kun spent a lot of money to make that happen. Yeah, so, but it was, I mean, it, I mean, it was really, um, I mean, the, the bandit crisis, the Lin Chung incident clearly was the, the key straw that broke the camel's back. And another thing that really, you know, really hurt the Republic of China was um, in 1923, there was a, a lot of talk about removing extraterritoriality from China. Every, you know, many of the foreign countries had extraterritorial privileges, which allowed them to be exempt by, um, from local law, local taxation, and the foreign governments all had their own court systems in China. And the Republican government felt that this was a violation of China's sovereignty. And so since the when the Republican government took power, they had made it a priority to do away with the extraterritorial privileges. And in 1923, they actually had set up a commission to start the process to reverse all of the extraterritorial privileges. And the commission was set to meet in November 1923. And the goal and the, the agenda was basically the removal of that. And that was a big, that was a huge, huge deal for the Chinese government at the time. Now, because of the Lin Chung incident, that commission did not move forward. And extraterritoriality remained in China until World War II. So this was another thing that actually, when you talk about the Republic of China was broke, 
the fact that it's not just President Lee in being ousted and removed from office, and it was just a continuation of the revolving door the of the warlords, but it also the the loss of the process or the abandonment of the process to remove extraterritoriality was a huge defeat for the Republican government. I saw that you recently visited Baudugu Mountain. What's it like today? I heard it's a, it's a resort. Um, I've been there, I mean, almost 10 times. I've lost track of it. In the last month, I've gone, I've, I've gone there twice um, for different reasons. And it's just a very, it's an impressive, very enjoyable location. And it's one of these um, tourist destinations that's not on anybody's bucket list, at least not yet. But it is a very impressive geographical area and beautiful. I mean, the temple structures, specifically the one that's at the foothills of Patsuko, is in the pretty much the same condition as it was in 1923. And there is a, is a ginkgo tree that is in the courtyard that's over a thousand years old. And you can look at this tree and it was the, it's the same tree that the hostages and the bandits were looking at in 1923. Same tree, you know, that they had their lunches under, their breakfast, they sat under the, in the shade of this tree. And it's so impressive. And the temple structures are very impressive. So I personally don't tire of going to this area to see, you know, this mountain. In fact, the road going to the mountain, you come over this crest and all of a sudden you see this huge cone-shaped mountain that comes into view. And it's the same view that both the hostages and the uh, bandits saw when they were hiking towards the mountain. And and in um, a number of the hostages wrote in their diaries about how once that mountain came into view, the bandits were yelling, Pazuku, Pazuku, smiling and energetic as if they came home. If they say arrive at their stronghold, they were just so excited to see the mountain. And I get the same level of excitement when I come over that crest and I see the mountain, I you. Anybody that sees that has to say, wow, wow, that's impressive, you know. And so, you know, in, um, but I anticipate at some point it may become, it may be something that's on the bucket list of those who read the book because it is a very impressive structure and it's something to see that that temple is unique and it's not one that has been torn down over the history that China has experienced since 1923. So it is a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. You tweeted out on March 13th that you were in Hong Kong for Lit Fest and visited the graves of the cousins, Eddie and Freddie, Eddie and Freddie Elias. And you mentioned they went on to live rather interesting lives. What became of those two? You didn't mention in your tweet. I mean, the, um, the Elias brothers were very, very interesting, came from a very interesting family. But after 1923, they returned to Shanghai and worked in the community. They were one, um, Eddie Elias was a stock brother, broker. His brother became active in construction work and building a number of communities, such as what is called Hague Court, which still exists in Shanghai today. But during World War II, Eddie Elias became an operative for British intelligence, and so he would be, um, you know, became well known in the community for his work on behalf of the British government in trying to you know, keep an eye on the, what the Japanese were doing in Shanghai at the time. And then Eddie himself was actually held prisoner by the Japanese prior to the war, and then when Japan invaded Shanghai, Eddie was imprisoned. He was actually imprisoned along with John Powell in the notorious prison called the Bridge House. And so, and an in, in interesting thing is Powell wrote about meeting Eddie Elias years later, 20 years after Lin Chang. You know, they, the both of them were hot, held hostage by the Chinese side, and they, now they were held hostage or prisoners by the Japanese. And then Powell made the comment that the two of them agreed that they prefer the Chinese captors over the Japanese. So, but anyway, the two of them ended up, both the Eddie Elias and Freddie Elias, they eventually emigrated in different directions. They went to Canada for a while, but then ultimately, you know, uh, ended up in Hong Kong. 
and were very well known in the Jewish community throughout Asia. And then they ultimately were, their bodies were buried in the Jewish cemetery in Happy Valley. And I paid them a visit only because it's just a unique part of history. And knowing the two of them played such a strong role in Shanghai's development, as well as in the, you know, in the Peking Express story. But when I went to the cemetery trying to search around for the gravestones, it was so cool to find that their graves were side by side, just like brothers should be. Have you ever seen the 1932 Hollywood production of Shanghai Express? Marlena Dietrich, Anna Mae Wong, and one of the giants of the Yellow Face era, Warner Oland. Yeah, I mean, the movie, it's interesting because there's a little bit of a story behind that is the the guy that wrote the screenplay, Harry Hervey, happened to be traveling around Asia in the 20s. Um, he was a tour guide operator for, you know, one of the Trans-Pacific ships that was uh, touring the area. And you have to imagine that he, like everyone else, was reading the daily newspapers of about, you know, the hostage crisis day after day after day. And so just by being present in Asia at the time and then reading the media, talking to people about it, he realized this is a great story to write about. And so his screenplay, though, is really remotely based on the issues. The train, of, I mean, the common things, it's a train that's held up in China. But it was also, you know, the Shanghai Express was going south, not north. There were counter-revolutionaries, not bandits. And one of the key things is that there was no march across the countryside. It was pretty much, the Shanghai Express was pretty much in one location on the train. But the, the, the real unique thing about the true story, the Peking Express, is that this was a march across the countryside involving, you know, you know over, you know, 100 people across with, you know, 1,000 bandits dragging them in their pajamas for days and being pursued by Chinese army troops. The same troops that were supplying the bandits with ammunition, by the way. But it was a warlike situation. And all of this, the true story actually, in my view, is much, much more exciting, you know, than the Shanghai Express. And then I've actually, people have asked me, you know, the famous line by Marlene Dietrich when the movie was, quote, it took more than one man to change my name to Shanghai Lily, unquote. <laughs> That was never attributed to anybody in the book. And some people hinted that that was that something that Lucy Aldridge said. And I said, no. And then even people have asked me and one of my daughters asked me was, hey, dad, the great story. But was there was there any romance? I mean, and quite frankly, you know, maybe Hollywood wants to know, was there any romance in the true story of the Peking Express? And my response was, you know, was maybe. And maybe because you had two honeymooners that were traveling around the world. And an interesting side story is that the bride, her name was Teresa Vieira, and they were from Mexico, a very wealthy couple from Mexico that were kept hostage. But Teresa Vieira refused to leave the side of her husband. And she was the only woman that was kept beyond, you know, the, you know, the initial period. And she ended up staying for a period of almost 20, 22 days. The bandits were trying to get rid of her. They basically were, gave her many opportunities to leave, but she did not leave. So in the diaries of the hostages, there was talk about the Bereas as honeymooners being side by side. And then they would take strolls in the woods near the temples where they were held hostage, you know. And so I, when my daughter asked me, is there any romance? And I, I, I said, I don't have details. And there was no specifics. But here you have honeymooners taking strolls in the forest. I have to say, maybe, you know. So, yeah, maybe there's romance. But there was not romance like you have in the Shanghai Express. And so, you know, Harry Hervey, the screenwriter, really elaborated and brought out some of the romantic um, ideas in that story, which but it, you don't have it in the true story. Yeah, they made it again in 1952. Yeah. Peking Express. Did that script stray even farther from the events that actually happened? 
Yeah, that gets uh, there was um, you know again the only thing that's really common was the it was a train involved. It was in China, you know, and it was held up. Hey, okay, it was good enough for Hollywood. Yeah, and in that situation, it was a, a you know quite different. And even I think you know Harry Hervey's original screenplay was really modified. I mean, the fact that this was in communist China, there was a lot of differences, a lot of things. In fact, I think the movie was not viewed very well by Beijing themselves, and they were not happy about it. But you know, but anyway, it was not consistent with the the true Peking Express story, which um, I think if it ever gets to the big screen, and if Hollywood does uh, is consistent with the the story in the book. I think they're going to find that the story itself is quite exciting, and that you don't need to take literary license because what the hostages in the, in the true story w- wrote about is a story that's quite exciting on its own. The epilogue you wrote was quite interesting, especially reading about what happened to the Peking Express hostages in the years that followed. You know, even today, with the challenges you expats in China face, they certainly seem more tame than what the expats of the 1920s had to go through. So the book tour kicks off in San Diego. What other cities will you be visiting? In April, I'm going to be going to, you know, not just uh, San Diego, but Portland, Oregon, New York, San Francisco, Berkeley. Yeah, and so April, I'm going to be bouncing around um, and then back to China in May for the 100th anniversary of the when the journey began on May 5th, and I'll be in Shanghai. I'm doing a tour of both the you know, Shanghai Railway Museum, which is the actual location where the journey began, as well as the weekend of the May 6th and 7th, I'll be giving tour of the Shandong area, Pazuku Mountain area. And then throughout Asia, I'll be back in Hong Kong and other cities in Asia to talk about the book, and then back to the U.S., for more events throughout the U.S. But what is it going to be fun about the tour is I'm going to be meeting up with and actually sharing the stage with the descendants of some of the the hostages that um, they are the, the, you know, the grandchildren and, and the grand nieces and nephews of some of the hostages or the rescuers. And they, you know, have a story to tell about how the Peking Express was part of their family history. And in one instance, when I get to Portland, Oregon, there's going to be a family that has collected the artifacts that their grandfather had collected on the train. And during his time as a hostage, such as getting a a, a knife from the bandits, a train blanket, and all sorts of other really cool artifacts that you know, we're part of the part of the incident. So I'll be making it a fun tour. So we'll have, you know, some of the descendants participate in the process. So but anyway, that's what I have planned for the tour um, and look forward to meeting people that have an interest in the whole affair. And then what I would like people to get out of this, not so much a history lesson, but I really believe and this is something that my publisher mentioned to me is that everybody loves a good train story. And that's what this is. It is a really great train story and it's China's great train robbery of 1923. And that's what, that is the key thing I want people to get out of it. It's a people story. You know, it's not a history lesson so much as it's a real people story. And especially in these times of U S China tensions, EU-China tensions, there's nothing like a good train story that is set in China. You know, there was so much to cover about the book. I feel we hardly made a dent. You're not coming to L.A. on this uh, book tour? Yeah, I'm actually going to be speaking at the Los Angeles Holocaust Museum on June 11th. And, And part of that is because eight of the final hostages out of the out of the there was 16 final foreign hostages eight of them were from the Jewish community in Shanghai and they have a fabulous fabulous story to tell as i mentioned about the Elias brothers and so you know the museum the holocaust museum is very keen to hear the stories of those in Shanghai from the Jewish community and i'm very very excited to be part of that eight Jews not quite a minion 
Well, I shan't keep you. I know these are busy times for you. Wheels up to the beautiful country tomorrow. I'll have links to the book at my website. And if you'd like to get more info, you can go to thepekingexpress.com to find out more. Thank you, Laszlo. I really appreciate the opportunity. It was, it's fun to talk about this and um, look forward to having a discussion with you at a later time as well. Just um, over over a beer, over a cup of coffee, cup of tea. Um, so very much enjoy doing that. So thank you very much. I'll try and make it. Well, I shan't keep you. I know these are busy times for you. Wheels up to the beautiful country tomorrow. I'll have links to the book at my website. And if you'd like to get more info, you can go to thepekingexpress.com to find out more. Thanks once again, James. This was a real pleasure. I can't wait to see the movie. Hope they can get Woody Harrelson to play Roy Anderson. That'd be great. Okay, maybe see you June 11th when you're in town. Okay, very good. Okay, mes amis, that's going to be it for this time. My thanks to James Zimmerman for coming on to the CHP. If you like modern Chinese history, this book will check all the boxes for you. The Peking Express, the bandits who stole a train, stunned the West, and broke the Republic of China. New from the good people at Hachette. All right, what else is there to say except on behalf of the group and ourselves, I hope we pass the audition. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from blissfully rainy Los Angeles, California. Think about coming back next time, would you? For what I'm assuring you will be another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.